Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. On a cold day in December of 2000, three friends were fishing on a secluded section of the Oder River in southwestern Poland when one of them noticed something strange floating in the water. At first, it looked like it might be a log, but when one member of the group went to get a better look, he was startled to see what appeared to be hair. Another one of the fishermen poked the mysterious object with his rod, only to realize that it was a human body. More specifically, the body of an unknown man. Little did these men know that they had just uncovered a crime that would both terrify and captivate the Polish public. One that might never have been solved if it weren't for the obsessive determination of one investigator. Before we get to the main part of today's story, we'd just like to start off with something of a preemptive apology to any Polish or Polish-speaking viewers out there. We did our best with the names and places in this one, but as English speakers, we've almost certainly butchered pronunciations in a few places. So yeah, sorry about that. All right, with that out of the way, let's get to the video. When police were called to the scene on the Oder River, the situation only got more disturbing when they managed to remove the body from the water. It was clear that whoever this man was, his death had been no accident. For starters, the man was wearing nothing but a sweatshirt and underwear at the time his body was recovered, making it easy to spot the various wounds that had been inflicted upon him before his death. A noose was found around his neck, but his hands were also bound behind his back. A closer inspection revealed that all of this had been done with the same rope, which at one point had connected the noose to the hands. In other words, the victim had been tied up in such a way that any attempt to free himself would have tightened the rope's hold around his neck. As if this weren't brutal enough to imagine, the crime was made even more disturbing during a subsequent autopsy, when it was revealed that the victim had almost no food in his system. This meant that his ordeal had likely lasted for several days before he was finally killed. To top it all off, evidence of water in his lungs suggested that he had still been alive when he was thrown into the river where he was eventually found. Understandably, the crime prompted a massive police investigation, which initially got off to a promising start. After someone noticed that the victim's long dark hair and blue eyes bore a striking resemblance to a man who had disappeared roughly four weeks earlier, the remains were positively identified as those of Dariusz Januszewski. Just as an aside here, I'm going to be using the anglicized version of Darius's first name going forward. Apologies if that bothers anyone, but I'm going to have to say it like a hundred times from here on out, and I just felt like this was preferable to me constantly stumbling over it. Anyway, back to the video. Darius Januszewski was a 35-year-old businessman from Wrocław, a city in southwestern Poland, not too far from the borders with Germany and the Czech Republic. He had last been seen on November 13th, when he left his small advertising firm to meet up with a client. He had been reported missing the following day, after failing to return home or answer countless phone calls from his wife the previous night. Understandably, police began their investigation into the chilling murder by digging into Darius's personal life. However, this proved far less helpful than they had initially hoped. In short, there seemed to be no reason for anyone to kill the 35-year-old, nor was there any particular person that authorities could identify that might want him dead. Darius had no debts, no enemies, and no criminal record. Those that knew him described him as a harmless and gentle man who never went looking for trouble. When he wasn't working hard at his advertising business, he liked to play the guitar and write music for his rock band. The only real source of tension investigators could find in the dead man's life were the marital problems he had recently experienced with his wife of eight years. However, according to friends and family, the couple had reconciled and were actually in the process of adopting a child when Darius went missing. At the same time that investigators were hitting dead ends in this search, a search on the ground was also failing to produce new leads. Scuba divers were sent into the ice-cold waters of the Oder River, and forensic teams scoured the forest surrounding the site where the body was found. Nothing of substantial value was recovered. 
The investigation would continue this way for six months until an announcement was made that it was being dropped. A local prosecutor stated at the time that authorities had been unable to identify the perpetrator or perpetrators. It seemed that whoever was responsible, they had just gotten away with a truly horrifying crime. It would stay this way for nearly three years, until the case landed on the desk of a man for whom it would become a personal obsession. That man's name was Jacek Wroblewski. Wroblewski was a 38-year-old detective working for the Wrocław Police Department when the unsolved murder case was handed over to his unit in the fall of 2003. Though the detective had tried out several different careers as a young man, he had been with the city's police force for nearly 10 years at this point, and found that the work suited him well. Part of the appeal was that he enjoyed catching criminals. However, there was a deeper layer to it than that. In particular, Wroblewski was deeply interested in understanding the criminal mind. So much so, that during the few free hours he had that weren't dedicated to work and family, he spent his time studying psychology at a local university. Like many people at the time, Wroblewski had heard about the Darius Januszewski case before it ever came across his desk. However, he didn't know all of the details of the case, and began by reviewing the investigation up to that point. First, Wroblewski turned his attention to the most concrete evidence that police had managed to uncover during their initial investigation, much of which concerned information they had managed to put together retracing the final hours leading up to Darius's disappearance. Chief among this evidence was a mysterious account from the dead man's mother. Darius's mother worked as a bookkeeper at his advertising business and told officers about a strange phone call she had received on November 13th, the day that her son was last seen. According to her, at about 9.30 a.m. that morning, an unknown man had called their office looking for Darius. He said that he needed a last-minute job done which required three signs to be printed at least one of which needed to be the size of a full billboard. However, when she tried to get more details from the caller, he was evasive, saying that he would only talk to Darius about the project. Not thinking much of it at the time, the mother explained that her son was out of the office, but that he could be reached on his cell phone. When she gave the man the number, he hung up without identifying himself. Darius's mother said that she did not recognize the caller's voice, but that he sounded professional. The only other detail she remembered was that there seemed to be a lot of background noise on the man's side of the phone call. When Darius returned to the office, she followed up with him about the mysterious client, and he told her that he had spoken to him and would be meeting with him that afternoon. Even more mysteriously, when investigators looked into the phone calls that had been made to Darius's office and cell phone that day, they discovered that both had been made from the same public payphone which was located just down the street from the advertising firm. The calls had been made in quick succession, with the cell phone call being placed less than a minute after the call to the office had ended. While this explained the background noise that Darius's mother had heard while speaking to the unknown caller, unfortunately, little else was uncovered by investigators. They concluded that anyone could have used the payphone that day, and considered the lead more or less a dead end. In addition to the details about the mysterious caller, there were two other pieces of evidence that stuck out to Wroblewski from the initial investigation into the case. The first was another statement made by a receptionist in the same building, who said that she had seen Darius leaving his office at around four in the afternoon. She claimed that as he walked down the street, there were two men who seemed to be walking behind him, though she could not give an adequate description of either of them. The second piece of evidence was Darius's car, which had been found by police still in the parking lot of his office after he was reported missing. This was strange, considering that Darius said he was going to meet the unknown client who had called him earlier that day. Those that knew Darius said that while it was not unusual for him to meet clients at places other than the office, he always drove his car to these appointments. After absorbing all of this information, Wroblewski started to try and draw his own conclusions about the case. The detective's strongest feeling about the murder was that whoever had committed the crime had done so for deeply personal reasons. The brutality of the killing was a large part of this, 
but there were other specific details that stood out to him as important. For starters, investigators had learned from speaking with Darius' wife that her husband always carried credit cards and bank cards. However, none of these had been used after his death, indicating that robbery was not the motive behind the crime. Next were the lack of clothes that Darius was wearing at the time that he was found. Vroblevsky theorized that he had been purposely stripped down by his attacker or attackers in a bid to humiliate him. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the bizarre account concerning the mystery caller seemed to suggest that the murder had been meticulously planned and targeted. Like investigators before him, Vroblevsky initially struggled to move beyond this point. Sure, his theory about someone having a murderous grudge against Darius made sense on paper, but with no obvious conflict in his life, it was impossible to know where to point the finger. However, Vroblevsky was determined, diligently reviewing the case file over and over again, convinced that there was something he was missing. Finally, he came up with an idea. It started when Vroblevsky was thinking about the phone calls and remembered that Darius' cell phone had never been found. While the initial investigators on the case had hit a dead end tracking the mysterious payphone calls, as far as he knew, no one had tried to trace the dead man's cell phone. It turned out that there was actually a good reason for this. At the time, Poland was apparently behind other European countries when it came to telecommunications infrastructure and development. This was further complicated by the fact that many of the nation's police forces didn't exactly have massive budgets, making investment in new investigative techniques like tracking cell phone and computer records beyond the capabilities of many law enforcement departments. However, this was starting to change around the time that Vroblevsky began re-examining Darius's case. Not only had the Wrocław Police Department recently hired a telecom specialist, but Wroblewski himself had taken an interest in these kinds of emerging investigative techniques. As a result, he reached out to the new specialist at his disposal and tried to see if Darius's cell phone could be tracked. While this initial effort only showed that Darius's cell phone had not been used since the time of his disappearance, Wroblewski was undeterred. After all, he knew that this had probably been a long shot anyway. Fortunately, he knew that there was more than one way to track a cell phone. In particular, Vroblevsky knew that the manufacturer included serial numbers on cell phones were also a valuable resource in these kinds of investigations. And amazingly, when he reached out to Darius's widow, she was able to find a receipt with this information on it. To Vroblevsky's surprise, his string of good luck continued when he was able to uncover a record of the cell phone from after Darius's disappearance. It turned out that the cell phone had been sold on an internet auction site called Allegro, which is apparently sort of the Polish equivalent of eBay. The sale happened four days after Darius had gone missing. The seller had logged in under the username ChrisB7, but further investigation would soon reveal his real name, Christian Bala. Christian Bala was a 30-year-old man originally from Hainov, a small town about an hour's drive west of Wrocław. Like many others, Bala had struggled as a young man following the collapse of the Soviet Union. He would eventually try his hand at business, though this was largely in a bid to support his wife Stasia and their young son. In reality, Bala's first and greatest love was philosophy. While attending university in Wrocław, Bala was known as one of the brightest students, and very much considered himself to be an intellectual. In particular, he became obsessed with postmodernist philosophers and their precursors, people like Friedrich Nietzsche, Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, and Richard Rorty. Though Bala ultimately dropped out of his PhD program to start his aforementioned business in the late 1990s, after only a couple of years the enterprise had gone bankrupt. His marriage also fell apart, and soon he and his wife Stasia split up. Apparently, this had less to do with Bala's poor financial situation and much more to do with his constant womanizing. Eventually, Bala left Poland altogether, at first traveling to the US and then to Asia, where he taught English and scuba diving. When Wroblewski first started looking into Bala, he was skeptical about whether he had any involvement in the Darius Januszewski case. After all, he figured, 
Bala could have acquired the dead man's cell phone anywhere before selling it. Maybe he even found it on the street. He also reasoned that it would be ridiculous for anyone who had plotted such a meticulous murder to then turn around and sell evidence so brazenly on the internet, let alone to use an obvious anglicization of his own name as a username. Finally, Bala didn't seem like the type to commit such a brutal crime. He appeared to have the disposition of a professor, not a hardened and experienced killer. However, being that Bala was his only lead, Roblevsky decided not to write him off completely and continued to dig into his background while preparing to contact him. It was during this time that the detective made a startling discovery, one that would completely alter his feelings about Bala and send him down a multi-year investigative rabbit hole. It turned out that earlier in 2003, Bala had fulfilled a lifelong dream of his when he published a book entitled Amok. The book was extremely obscure at the time and was not carried in many bookstores. Those that did carry the title reportedly kept it out of sight, hidden up on high shelves where you would most likely have to go out of your way to find it. When Froblevsky got his hands on the book, he discovered that there was good reason for this. What he found in its pages disturbed him to his core. While Amok was apparently never translated into English, according to sources we could find, it is about one man's descent into a spree of absolute depravity. Graphic descriptions of the main character's escapades with drugs and women are littered throughout the novel, which finally culminates in the character murdering his girlfriend. Central to the premise of the entire thing is Bala's particular brand of philosophy, in which he reiterates his views over and over again in various ways that truth is an illusion and that he is above any sort of morality. Though it was clear to Froblevsky that Bala had written Amok to be deliberately provocative, he felt that there was something deeper going on. As he dug further and further into the novel's contents, he began to see it as a sort of warped confession about the murder of Darius Yanashevsky. Over the next couple of years, Vroblevsky would become obsessed with the novel, turning into sort of a half-literary critic, half-detective, and compiling endless examples from Amok in order to try and prove his theory. For starters, there were similarities between Bala's life and the life of his main character. The character was named Chris, spelled in the same shortened and anglicized way that Christian Bala had used for his username for the internet auction site. Both Chris and Christian had similar backstories. They were separated from their wives due to their womanizing, had serious problems with alcohol, and had run failed businesses. Bala had even written in numerous anecdotes that appeared to be wholly lifted from his own life, including a time that he and his friend were arrested for stealing a statue of St. Anthony from a local Catholic church while on a drinking binge. Though it's common for authors to include details of their own lives in their fictional work, Vroblevsky felt that there were things in Amok that directly referenced Darius's murder. For instance, near the end of the book, when Chris murders his girlfriend, he describes placing a noose around her neck. Even things that weren't exactly the same seem to eerily overlap with the real-life crime in Vroblevsky's mind. For instance, in the novel, Chris uses a Japanese knife during the murder. While Darius had not been stabbed, in the book, Bala's character goes on to describe how he gets rid of the murder weapon by selling it on an internet auction site. While Vroblevsky was certain of his theory, he knew that he would need more than some macabre details from Bala's novel to convince a court of law about his guilt in the Darius Yanashevsky case. As he looked elsewhere for clues, he managed to stumble upon one other piece of compelling circumstantial evidence. It turned out that just one month before Darius went missing, Bala had used his account on the same internet auction site where he would later sell the cell phone to look up one particular listing. It was for a police manual about discerning the difference between accidental, self-inflicted, and criminal hangings. The manual also described several ways a noose could be tied. Ultimately, Bala never purchased the manual, though Vroblevsky was sure that it was evidence showing how he had planned Darius's murder. Finally, in the fall of 2005, 
Wroblewski decided that he had to take action on the case when he learned that Bala would be returning to Poland to visit his parents for the first time in years. On the afternoon of September 5th, Bala was taken into custody. We should point out here that there are two wildly differing accounts of how this arrest took place. Wroblewski maintains it was a standard apprehension that was carried out to the letter of the law. Bala, meanwhile, would tell a harrowing tale of being attacked and kidnapped in the middle of the street by a group of men. He claimed that these men beat him, put a bag over his head, and drove him out into the middle of the woods, threatening to kill him numerous times before eventually taking him to the police station. It's unclear which of these versions of events is closer to the truth, though most of the reports we came across seem to side with Wroblewski. This is in no small part because of Bala's well-known penchant for embellishment. See, it turned out that the idea that truth was an illusion wasn't just an idea that Bala explored in his fictional work. As friends and family knew all too well, he also applied this to his daily life. While Bala described this habit in terms that were simultaneously intellectual and almost romantic, as far as we can tell, oftentimes it amounted to little more than run-of-the-mill boasting, the kind of tall tales that someone might tell to pump themselves up in order to seem greater than they really are. Except, in Bala's case, his stated goal was to do this so often that the truth about his life was indistinguishable from what he had made up. He apparently called this mytho-creativity. While this might seem harmless enough on its face, it immediately became consequential following Bala's arrest, when Wroblewski finally got a chance to question him. Bala promptly denied any involvement in Darius's murder, and when Wroblewski was forced to take his evidence against the writer to court, it was determined that he didn't have a strong enough case. Instead, Bala was charged with selling stolen property in connection with Darius's cell phone, as well as an unrelated bribery charge. Neither would result in Bala serving any jail time. Following his release from custody, Bala went on the offensive, repeating his accusations about police brutality and claiming that he was being persecuted for his art. He said that his novel was a work of fiction, nothing more, and many members of the public agreed. Instead of outrage being directed at Bala, it was instead focused on the police and their investigation against him. It's important to note that this is a pretty understandable reaction on the public's part, though, given that at this point, the country's days of Soviet rule weren't that far behind it, during which it was all too common for artists to be censored and persecuted for their work. Despite the massive setback for police, the situation wasn't all bad, though. Bala's charges in the stolen property and bribery case were enough to keep him in the country, as he was required to hand over his passport. In fact, the passport actually led to Wroblewski uncovering another piece of circumstantial evidence in the case. The evidence in question related to a Polish true crime television show called 997, which according to sources we came across in our research, was sort of like the country's version of America's Most Wanted. In early 2002, the show did a segment about Darius's case, which was soon followed by a post of the show's webpage meant to offer the latest news and updates about the investigation. When Wroblewski initially looked into the page's data as part of his investigation, he was surprised to learn that people were visiting the website from as far away as the US, Japan, and South Korea. This became far less odd once Wroblewski got a hold of Bala's passport. Using the dates from the stamps on the passport and data from the 997 website, the detective was able to match each of these out-of-country page views with Bala's travel history. To Wroblewski, it was proof that Bala had been keeping tabs on the Darius Januszewski investigation. At the same time that Wroblewski made this discovery, a couple of members of his team uncovered even more incriminating information. While reviewing the phone evidence in the case yet again, they uncovered something that up until then had apparently been missed. The mysterious payphone calls that had been made to Darius's office and cell phone on the day that he went missing had been made with a phone card. Each of these phone cards were encoded with a unique number that pinged the phone company any time it was used. Using this information, the team's telecommunications expert was able to determine the rest of the call history tied to this particular phone card. 
Almost all of the calls had been made to friends and family members of Christian Bala. While this was possibly the most compelling piece of evidence yet tying Bala to the murder, Vroblevsky was determined not to repeat the mistakes he had made when he went after Bala the first time. Instead of moving on the information, he continued to build his case. In Vroblevsky's mind, the single biggest missing piece of the puzzle was motive. Sure, they now had a lot of circumstantial evidence that looked incriminating, but they had nothing that connected Bala directly to Darius. They needed to know what had prompted him to commit such a brutally personal crime. For this, Vrobolevsky went back to square one with Bala's background and began to interview far more people about his personal life. This time, a much darker picture emerged. The people that spoke to Vroblevsky revealed that around the time of Darius's murder, Bala's life had been in shambles. His business had fallen apart, and his marriage to his wife Stasia was poised to go next. However, rather than painting Bala as the way that he had wanted to be seen, as a sort of tragic yet brilliant ladies' man who drank too much, this time, people started to reveal another side to him. As a jealous, controlling husband who was lashing out at anyone who got near his wife. In one instance, where Bala had tried to fight a bartender who he believed was making advances towards Stasia, one of his friends reportedly told police that he was, quote, running amok. Froblevsky was sure that this is where the title of his novel had come from. Even more chilling was a statement from another witness who had seen Bala try and attack the bartender. They claimed that they had heard Bala say that he had already dealt with the guy who had tried to hit on his wife. This was just weeks after Darius's body had been found. With the jealousy now established as the likely motive behind the crime, the only thing Vroblevsky was missing was a solid link between Bala and the victim. This finally came when the detective spoke to one of Stasia's friends. The friend told Vroblevsky that in the summer of 2000, she had gone with Stasia to a nightclub in Wrocław called Crazy Horse. At the time, Stasia was still getting over her separation from Bala and needed a fun night out. At some point, she had met a man with long dark hair and blue eyes who was going through marital troubles of his own. His name was Darius Januszewski. The two had talked for a while and exchanged numbers before parting ways. With all of this evidence now in hand, Vroblevsky decided to approach Stasia directly. He had tried this before, of course, but up until now she had completely refused to take part in the investigation. This time, though, things would be different. While it's unclear what exactly got Stasia to talk, most of the reports we came across suggest that at least part of it had to do with Vroblevsky bringing excerpts from Bala's book with him to show Stasia during their conversation. She had apparently never read the novel before, but was disturbed enough by the similarities between Bala's main character and his actions in real life that she became convinced of his guilt. Not only did she confirm the story about meeting Darius at the nightclub, she said that the two of them had actually arranged to go on a date the week after. Though they did go out, ultimately nothing happened between them, and soon after, Darius reconciled the marital problems he had been having with his wife. According to Stasia, though, several weeks after her date with Darius, Bala showed up in a drunken rage at her apartment. He said that he knew that she was having an affair, and that he had hired a private investigator who told him everything about her meeting with Darius. He even knew exactly where they had gone. Stasia said that the main reason she had never come forward before this was that she had asked Bala about the disappearance and he had denied any involvement, and she didn't believe that he was capable of murder. Not only did this clear up the final remaining pieces of the puzzle for Vroblevsky, but it also gave him insight into a line in Bala's novel that he had been struggling to decode for some time. It read, quote, This was the one killed by blind jealousy. As far as Vroblevsky was concerned, this was possibly the most direct confession in a muck. Bala had killed Darius in a blind and jealous rage. Bala's house was subsequently raided, and he was placed under arrest. By the time Bala went on trial in February of 2007, the case was making headlines across Poland. The story of a disturbed philosopher-slash-writer confessing to his crimes through his novel 
was understandably quite sensational, and actually caused many to go out and purchase Bala's book. It seemed that everyone else was finally seeing what Detective Roblevsky was after all these years. The trial reportedly did not disappoint those who were looking for a spectacle. Apparently, as part of Poland's justice system, defendants are allowed to question witnesses directly, and Bala made full use of this opportunity during the trial. At the same time, the prosecution dropped even more evidence of Bala's chilling behavior. Much of this had to do with a laptop that was found during the raid on Bala's house, on which was a file protected with the password AMUK. On the file were graphic descriptions of Bala's intimate encounters with more than 70 women, where he used language extremely similar to the main character of his novel, Chris. This wasn't even the most disturbing discovery, however. In another, more cryptic document on the laptop, authorities found evidence that seemed to suggest Bala was plotting a second murder, that of Stasia's new boyfriend, a man named Harry. When the trial came to a close, Bala was convicted of the murder of Darius Yanishevsky and sentenced to 25 years in prison. A few weeks later, he was granted a retrial, apparently on the basis that there were still gaps in the logical chain of evidence in the case. While it's true that there are plenty of unanswered questions about Darius's murder, even arguably including just how many people were actually involved, if you ask us, it seems pretty clear that the evidence against Bala was strong enough for a conviction. It appears that the Polish courts ultimately agreed, as when Bala was retried a year later, he was once again found guilty. That being said, he reportedly continues to deny any involvement in Darius's murder to this day. The most recent information we could find about Bala states that he is currently working on his second novel, entitled Deliric. Apparently, this is a pun meaning both lyrics, as in a story, or delirium. Though little is apparently known about the book, part of the manuscript was found on Bala's laptop that was seized at the time of his arrest. During an interview with New Yorker writer David Gran in 2008, Bala claimed his new novel would be even more extreme than his first one. At the time, he claimed he would finish the book, no matter what happened. Now that you've heard the whole story, though, what do you think? Is there anything you think we missed or left out? Also, just FYI, this story was originally meant to be just one on a larger list of stories about writers who turned out to be criminals before we realized it was long enough to make into a standalone. If you'd like to see us tackle the other cases on that list in a future video, be sure to let us know in the comments section below. While you're there, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our future releases. And as always, thank you for watching.